Ah, the dream of a solar-powered EV, the kind of minivan or truck or crossover that you could drive every day on your daily commute and it would just charge itself from the magnificence of the sun. It's a lovely dream, but it's a really, really long way off. One might even say practically impossible if we're thinking about electric vehicles like this Ford Lightning right here. Now, there are some solar EV prototypes out there and they seem to have relatively decent range. They seem to be able to do what those manufacturers are claiming, at least in prototype form, with a lot of caveats. They probably wouldn't work on my daily commute where I drive up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass. They certainly wouldn't work for you if you had a really long commute or if you lived in an area that didn't get a great deal of sun. You're probably still going to be charging up. But the big reason for that is efficiency. This is nowhere near as efficient as a Tesla Model 3 or a Kia EV6, and it is a bazillion light years away from the efficiency that we find on those solar powered prototypes. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the solar charging realities that I experience out here in the Santa Cruz Mountains and why something like this Lightning is pretty darn difficult to integrate into a solar-powered off-grid setup like mine. I live off-grid at least 11 months of the year. Sometimes in December and January, we will reconnect to the grid because we don't really have too much choice out here. Sometimes it's just raining too hard and it's too cloudy. But the vast majority of the year, I am off-grid. And something like this Lightning absolutely would not work for me long term. Let me be really upfront with that. And the main reason is efficiency. This vehicle has been averaging 1.7 to 1.8 miles per kilowatt hour you know, over the routine driving that we've been doing with it. So just using it like we do towing, uh, daily commuting, etc., that kind of stuff, average is pretty darn low. The average in something like an EV6 or a Model 3, that's gonna be up there towards four miles per kilowatt hour, at least three oftentimes up there towards four, so significantly more efficient. And that's a really, really big deal when you think about how solar powered systems work. Right now it's the morning, it's about 10 a.m. when I'm filming this video. Sun's over there and the sun is not at its power generation peak, but guess what? Most people are at work right now, and that is one of the first problems that you need to understand when it comes to charging your vehicle off of your home solar. Big cautionary statement, in this video, I'm gonna be using a lot of generalized statements, and these statements may or may not apply to you. If you have any feedback, of course, comment down there in the comment section, and if you have any questions, I'm gonna be doing some follow-up videos. This video is, in fact, based on a lot of requests from all of you out there to talk about how an EV like this could integrate in a solar off-grid lifestyle. Let's start there. First thing to know, again, I live completely off-grid 11 months of the year. Second thing to know is I, like most of you, and like the vast majority of electric vehicle owners, generally commute into the office every day. Most of our staff for Alex and Autos and EV Buyer's Guide, etc., they're all in an office. I go to that office when I'm not traveling, and I generally drive either a press vehicle or one of my electric vehicles to the office. And then because my office is not necessarily always powered by green electricity, I do choose that option from our local utility, but who knows where the power really comes from at any exact moment. I prefer to charge my EV at home, again, due to the magnificence of the sun that is providing free energy. When I can get that free energy, the first thing we should tackle is efficiency because this is something that a lot of folks don't think about when they're thinking about off-grid solar. There is an incredible amount of loss between the solar panels and the vehicle itself. And that's not including the incredible amount of loss that we get in the panels because they're only about 20% efficient. So of the energy that is coming down from the sun, only 20% of that gets turned into electricity. My panels, they're rated for 15 kilowatts total. Uh, they will never really achieve that at this latitude, even in bright hot sun, because that's just how solar panels work. So always factor in a reduction in the actual power output ability of your solar panels. Ours will really produce about 12,000 watts. So let's just go with watt hours or kilowatt hours here. So 12,000 watt hours theoretically is our baseline. That's the amount of oomph we can put into the system in one hour, 12,000 watt hours. What happens to that 12,000 watt hours? Well, about 8% of it is consumed by the charge controllers in terms of heat. So they're 92% efficient, 8% just gets lost, gets thrown onto the fire. That's 960 watts of loss, bringing us down to 11,040. Then we have battery charge cycle efficiency. 
We use lead acid batteries because they are infinitely recyclable right now. There is a current recycling path and they are 90% post-consumer content currently. And that was one of the big factors uh, of why we chose that particular path. Also less expensive than lithium ion, although the costs are dropping rapidly with lithium batteries. Now this battery pack, again, 85% efficient. So we lose 2,600 watts on that battery alone, 9,384. Again, the truck is at the office. I charge it in the afternoon when the battery is already full. If on the other hand, you could charge your EV when the sun is shining, then this is going to be a great deal more efficient because you're not going to lose that approximately 25% energy because it's AC connected and the battery is of course DC. So there's still a reasonable amount of loss in that system, but obviously less than with the lithium ion battery packs. One quick digression here, lithium ion battery packs are generally speaking more efficient in terms of their cycle efficiency versus lead acid. They can be right around 95% efficient in their own right, but AC connected lithium ion batteries, as we see in some of Tesla Powerwall products and a number of other AC connected Powerwall products from like Enphase and other companies like that, they end up at around 90% charge cycle efficiency because of their AC connected nature. They have to rectify that AC power to DC in order to charge the battery, and then they have to invert it back, of course, to AC in order for you to use it for your appliances. So that cycle efficiency ends up being a little bit closer to lead acid efficiency, but you have to look at the entire system to actually directly compare. So you can do the math yourself and then let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. But you will be losing less energy than with lead acid batteries, but you're gonna pay more for the battery. Whether or not that works for you just depends on your situation. So back to this. Again, the reason that we went with lead acid battery was the recycle ability and the fact that even though efficiency is low, cost-wise, it's actually more cost-effective to just throw more batteries and throw more panels at the problem than to focus on efficiency in this particular instance. Obviously, it's a little bit different for a car right here. Now, then we have to invert the power out of the battery when you go home and plug your EV in. So the inverters, they're 94% efficient. So there we have lost yet more power. We're down to 8,820 watts. So total loss of 3,179 watts since we started. Things are really starting to add up here. Then of course, there's the onboard level two charger and its efficiency rating. In this vehicle, it's around 90% efficient. But this is going to depend on the vehicle you plug in. So if the vehicle you plug in, for instance, does not have a liquid cooled battery pack like a Nissan Leaf, it actually might be more efficient than this because some efficiency is lost when we're talking about charge cycle because I'm putting in power, the vehicle is cooling the battery. So not only do we have the losses of the battery, the losses of the level two charger, but we also have the consumption of the cooling systems for the battery pack, the coolant loops, et cetera. And there is definitely a huge variation here. The Rivian R1T, for instance, consumes considerably more power in cooling the battery pack than this Ford Lightning, but you can still factor in about a 10% loss. So now we're down to 7,938 watts of power, or watt hours of power, I really should say, available to the vehicle. So one hour of the sun shining on my panels, producing 12,000 watt hours, 12 kilowatt hours. By the time it gets into the vehicle, it's just under eight kilowatt hours with a total loss of about four kilowatt hours over that day. So you could definitely see the efficiency problem with living off grid with an EV like this. It requires that you drastically size up your array drastically size up your battery pack as well, especially if you have a longer commute. My commute's only about 30 some odd miles each way. So with a vehicle like this, that's gonna mean that I'm gonna need to stuff in about 30 kilowatt hours of energy after commuting a day. That's a huge, huge draw. But in something like an EV6, it's only gonna be about 12 to 15 kilowatt hours. Or in a plug-in hybrid where you might use a little bit of gasoline, maybe you could drop that down to 10 or 15 kilowatt hours. And that's one of the reasons that I tend to like plug-in hybrids for my lifestyle here. Because if it's raining or if it's cloudy one day, I don't have to worry about, can I make it to the office on my charge in the EV because I didn't charge it there. I can just run on gasoline when I have to. Now, logically, there is enough solar real estate to help keep the battery topped up when you go away for a weekend or even give you a little bit of charge. If this had maybe a thousand watts of panels on it, it could slowly charge over time because the power consumption when idle is quite low. If on the other hand, you're in an R1T or some modern Teslas, battery power consumption when idle is pretty high, but something like a solar panel on the roof would drop that down to effectively zero. So it's still not a bad idea. 
it's just not the panacea that a lot of people are looking for. It's not the holy grail. Living off-grid with an EV is pretty darn tricky. And that's part of the reason that I'm not entirely clear that any EV pickup truck is right for me at the moment. I had really high hopes for this, I had really high hopes for the Rivian, but their actual power consumption ends up really a problem for me. For the Lightning, it's not the idle power consumption, it's just the daily rumble of power consumption. The Rivian is 30-35% more efficient in daily driving. On the other hand, the Rivian will ultimately use about the same kind of power as the Lightning over a week because the Rivian consumes so much power when it's doing absolutely nothing that even though it's more efficient on the road, it ends up using the same amount of power as this much bigger Lightning, and in some instances, even more. If I'm away for a week, it will consume far more than the Lightning. It will consume about 30 kilowatt hours on its own, doing absolutely nothing just sitting in the driveway and I just don't have that kind of power available. Let me know what you guys think about all that down there in the comment section, and let me know what else you would like to know about solar panel living, solar off-grid living, and electric vehicles, things like that. Just uh, type down there in the comment section, and we will try and gather those comments and create future videos. See all of you later.